Father, as we come now to study your word, I pray um, that we would all be encouraged, that we would be clearer when we leave about you and who you are and about who you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. And may we be um, encouraged by grace this morning that you are with us in the midst of challenges. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning we're going to look at a passage of Scripture from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And this, this passage obviously comes after Hebrews chapter 11, which is the chapter before. And uh, in chapter 11 we see these amazing accounts of the people uh, of faith, these heroes of the, the life of faith. And their, their lives, they testify to the power of faith. And then at the beginning of chapter 12, the, the attention is turned to the readers, to the hearers, and, and we're given an encouragement, and that's what we're going to read this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 say this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Our passage for this morning compares the life of faith the life of just following Jesus to a race. It's like a, a course with a, a starting point, a route, and a finish line. And with the start of a new year, I thought it would be pretty appropriate for us to, to think about something like a race. Some of you may be busy riding your Peloton. Or um, can, can we get a moment of silence for Peloton guy? Because he bought his wife a bike. What is wrong with that? And then he got criticized by everybody. We've all been there. We've all been there. Um, maybe some of you are getting ready for a race, a 5K, a half marathon, a marathon. We have some iron people here, um, which is just crazy. Um, the rest of us are normal. <laughs> and we admire, we admire people who run. We just don't really want to be like them, right? Yeah. Wow, you're going to run a marathon. Good for you. <laughs> That's one way to live. A few years ago, we bought a treadmill. Everybody's bought a treadmill. And uh, I was going to get in shape. They had things, so I looked up ways to get in shape. They had things like couch to 5K, 5K to half marathon, 5K to marathon. Uh, but I'm an over aspiring overachiever. And so I searched couch to marathon. As it turns out at the time, there was not a plan for that. No one else was thinking about making that jump up from... And I'm sitting on the couch and I want to run a marathon. It's probably not surprising to you that I never ran a marathon. And our treadmill is dusty in our basement. <laughs> Regardless of whether you consider yourself an athlete or not, the Bible says that the life of faith is like a race and we are runners in it. Not in the sense of competing against one another, but we all have a race to run. We have a course to navigate, a start and a finish. So a question for you today, how's the race of faith going for you? Many of you here are uh, followers of Jesus. Uh, some of you may not be, and, and if that's the case, that's fantastic. I'm so glad that you're here. I hope this is helpful. I want to give you a really honest window into what the life of faith looks like, and I hope that's helpful. But if you're a follower of Jesus, then you are in the race of faith, and how's it going? Are you thriving in your faith or just barely hanging on? To use the language of a race, are you energized and ready to take the next hill or are you exhausted and struggling to put one foot in front of the other? Kind of regardless of where you're at today, I want to serve as a, a coach or a, a cheerleader for you in your race of faith. And in the few minutes we have, I want to do three things from our, our passage this morning. First, I want to define the race that we're in. I want to give you three tips for running. And then I want to share the secret 
to finishing the race. So first, uh, defining the race. There are different kinds of races. We all know this. You have the extreme of the Ironman or um, the ultra marathon all the way down to the 5K run walk. You know, that you walk a little, then you run a little, and you maybe walk a little. And when you feel like running, you run a little bit more. It's kind of my, it's my workout routine there. Uh, there's different kinds of races, but there's a big difference between those races. So what, what kind of, knowing what kind of race you're running is significant if you're going to run it well. Well, what kind of race is being talked about here? I want to suggest that it's less of a 5K and more of a tough mutter. <laughs> I've never done one of these, but, but they look awful. It's, just, <laughs> it's a 10 to 13 mile long endurance event. And believe it or not, the distance is not the hard part. It's the obstacles. You crawl through the mud under barbed wire. You, have, you run through fires. I mean, what, you, people run through electrified wires. Those people need to be checked out. Um, <laughs> crawl through a cage underwater. It's kind of, it's kind of what parenting feels like sometimes. But <laughs> you're just you're just thinking. Um, so why is the race of faith like a tough mutter? Well, the book of Hebrews is written to people who are ready to give up. They're experiencing persecution for their faith and the challenges of life, and they're ready to just quit following Jesus and go back to their life. For them, it was in Judaism. And in response, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us three things that help us understand this race. The first one is the interesting word they choose for race. In Greek, it's the word agona. It's the word we get our word agony from. <laughs> Tell us there's going to be challenges. There will be some pain, some straining, some striving involved in this life of faith. Second, the writer mentions this, this cloud of witnesses. And if, if you go back and read chapter 11, these are people who had some noteworthy lives but a few of them are mostly positive. Many of them were hard, difficult lives. Um, some ended in death. And the third thing we get is he mentions Jesus. And everything went easy, smooth sailing for him, right? Not so much. He, we read he, he endured the cross, which is he underwent torture at the hands of the Romans. Why such depressing pictures of the life of faith? Here's, here's what I think is going on. The Bible is being extremely honest. I think the readers maybe thought that following Jesus would improve their lives, but they're discovering that following Jesus means lots of changes for them, some difficult. Changes for their relationships, their thinking has to change, their lifestyle is going to change, their use of resources, their community. All of these things are going to change. And change, even positive change, can be difficult. It's true then, it's true now. And the author, by sharing these stories, is reorienting their perspective on the suffering and difficulty in their lives. He's clarifying what kind of race they're in so they don't lose heart when they face obstacles. Their perspective is being reoriented by their new expectations. I'm sure that tough mutter competitors, they don't enjoy the obstacles, although they are a little bit... Um, Crazy. So maybe they do, but they don't enjoy the obstacles, but it's what they signed up for. So they're not surprised by them. Author C.S. Lewis, a follower of Jesus who, who got married uh, much later in his life, um, he, he, he found this woman, this wonderful woman he married, and four years later she died of cancer. And in a, his book, A Grief Observed, he shares this. We were promised sufferings. They were part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn, and I accept it. I've got nothing I haven't bargained for. And then he, he adds this, and I love the honesty. Of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself and not to others. And in reality, not imagination. How true is that? How honest is that? We know in theory that relationships can be hard, that jobs can be lost, that kids can rebel, that cars break down, that people can have negative reactions to your faith, that people get sick and die. But somehow I fall into, we fall into the trap of thinking, 
well, that's generally only going to happen to others and probably not to us until it does happen to us. Some of you are in the midst of difficulties right now, and I hope this message will be an encouragement to you. Uh, You are not crazy. The race of faith is going to have some nice, easy downhill stretches where the wind is at your back and everything feels great. But it will also have challenging times that will test you to your core. And you will find yourself in the same place as the original readers, wondering, is it worth it? Others of you, you're you're doing great. You can just be quiet. No. Um, (laughs) You're doing great, and that's awesome. But sometime soon, maybe this year, something will happen to you and not just to others. And it will be very real and not just imagined. And it will challenge you in the race of faith. It's okay. This is a tough mutter. It's not a 5K. It's also a race that's worth it. And we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. So that's the race we're in. It's a difficult race full of obstacles. Sorry to say that, but... But thankfully, the writer doesn't just leave us there. They, they give us some advice for running this race of faith. We see three things in verses 1 and 2. Uh, two things to avoid and one thing to adopt. So the first one, or um, in the middle of verse 1, we read this. Let us also lay aside. And the, the picture here is of um, someone taking off extra things that would be encumbering them on a race, um, one of our staff members actually has run a marathon. Daniel has run a marathon. Of course, Daniel has run a marathon. Um, and uh, he told me this, so it's not, blame him if it's wrong, um, that a lot of runners, when they're running a marathon, they start with sweats on because it's cold and you've got to start early in the morning. And so you need these sweats to be able to start the race. But then it, as you get going and it starts to warm up and you get a little further in, this, this is kind of encumbering you, and so you, you take it off and you just throw it in a pile at some point in the race so you can run better. That's, that's the picture we're get, being given here of laying things aside as we run this race. And we're given two things to lay aside. Here's the first one. Let us lay aside every weight. The idea here is of a runner carrying extra weight And we all know that running is harder when you are weighed down. In high school, I participated in a track and field event. I don't think they have it here, um, but in Wisconsin, it was was this event called the Weightman's Relay. And at the end of every track meet, they would parade out the Weightman, the throwers, discus and shot put. And I I was a discus thrower. And they would have us run against each other in a relay race, a four by 100 meter relay race. It was Great that they kept it a short distance because you only have to run 100 meters. Anybody can run 100 meters. Um, But uh, it was always a spectacle because it was the last event and all the runners had run their races, the two milers and the milers, and and they would watch the runners run. A lot of jiggling happened as they (laughs) ran around that one loop. Who do you think ran that loop, that four by one faster? The sprinters or the weightmen? The sprinters, of course. It is harder to run when you're carrying extra weight. Weight here is distinguished from sin. It's mentioned in a second. and So I believe the author is referring to things that are, are not wrong, but aren't helpful. Things that slow you down in the race of faith. The first readers were struggling with some of the cultural baggage from their life in Judaism. And these weren't bad things. They weren't sin but they were hindering the race of faith for them. As I was thinking about uh, my own life, pretty quickly a a few examples uh, came to mind. Um, Staying up late. When you have small kids, you want to stay up late because you want to feel like you have a life. (laughs) But staying up late is not helpful for me. When I do it, I find myself hitting snooze again and again and again until the very last minute, and I, I don't get to do the things that refresh me spiritually, to read the Bible and pray. And after a while of that, I become lethargic and I feel disconnected. It's just not helpful. Staying up late's not wrong, but it's not helpful. TV is another one that came to mind for me. Just watching too much TV, 
whenever I watch a lot of TV, I'm, not, I'm never re-energized or refreshed. I just kind of am. In, in Colorado, I think recreation can fall into this category. Skiing, camping, hiking, fly fishing, those are all great things. But if they become priorities over things like worship or community, they can become hindrances or weights in the race of faith. They're not wrong, but sometimes they don't help. Uh, parents, your, your kids' activities can become hindrances to their faith development. In high school, I remember there was this one time where I had to choose between uh, going on the, the youth group retreat or winter basketball practices. And uh, guess which one won? Basketball. It's not, that's not wrong, but guess what always won? Basketball. Always won. And, until, really, I wasn't involved in a faith community at all. And I, I had good friends, and I love basketball, but um, it was hindering me in my race of faith. I think oftentimes we ask, is this thing right or wrong? And here we're being challenged to ask, is this helpful? Is this helping me in the race of faith? If it's not helping us follow Jesus, it might just be a hindrance, a weight that's making life more difficult. What are the things in your life that they aren't wrong, but they aren't helpful in the race of faith? They're like carrying extra weight when you're running a race. That's running tip number one. Lay aside every weight. Running tip number two comes, also comes in verse one. It says this, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. So lay aside sin is the second thing we're given. We move from things that are neutral to things, behaviors, attitudes, actions that are wrong that go against God's design for us and his intention. And the, the picture here is sin that clings so closely. Or the translations say, sin that entangles or sin that distracts. And here's what I think is going on. Uh, we are being encouraged to deal with our sin as a serious thing. In the race of faith, sin entangles. It distracts. It clings to us. A, a while back, I, I read about an actor who and was recovering from a major health incident. He was a comedic actor, so he said it in a funny way. He said he was uh, recovering from a wee touch of the stroke. <laughs> he, was, he was joking, of course, because he, he almost died, and this was a, a major issue. It was extremely serious. But if I'm being honest, I can all, often treat my own sin in that way. Ah, just a wee bit of sin, no big deal. But a stroke, at whatever level, is, is a serious thing. And sin is serious, too. It's not just a neutral thing. It's damaging to us spiritually. It hurts our relationships. It steals our peace. It kills our joy. It has all sorts of real-life consequences. It hinders us in the race of faith. So we're being encouraged here to fight against our sin, to lay it aside, it's clinging to us, tear it off. It's entangling us, get loose. It's distracting us, look away from it. But there's one problem. We, we can't do it. Because sin is tempting. I don't, I don't think we often talk about this. On some level, I believe, we believe, that, that what sin offers will actually be better. But what sin really does is it entangles, it ensnares, it distracts. On some deep level, I don't think we believe that what God says is best for us. So we get tangled up. How do we get untangled? You and I can't deal with our sin or even the weights in our lives. We can't lay them aside unless we adopt something else. And so that's running tip number three. It's the end of verse one and beginning of verse two. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Here's the, the third and final tip for running. Look to Jesus. Other versions say, fix our eyes on Jesus. If we want to run the race of faith with endurance, that is when things get hard, when we are tempted by weights and sin, 
we need to look to Jesus. Only Jesus offers us the forgiveness of sins, grace when we fail, and the power to start again. We look away from sin that distracts us by looking to something, by looking to Jesus. The two go together. We read that he is the founder and perfecter of our faith. So when it comes to the race of faith, you and I are not lead runners in this race. We run a well-worn course of faith that Jesus has already run. He's the author, we read, or the pioneer. Jesus is the prime example of our faith. This would have been significant to the the Jewish readers um, of the time because chapter 11 detailed the lives of all of their heroes, people like Noah and Abraham and Moses. But the writer points out that Jesus is an even greater source of encouragement. The promises they received find their fulfillment in him. He founded the race. He founded the faith. He ran the race and perfected or completed the life of faith. We read in verse 3 that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It's finished. It's over and done. Now, as we run the race, the course marked out for us, we look to him We learn from him. We are inspired and empowered by him to keep running. To deal with the sin. To turn from it. To drop the weights. So the race, it's a a tough mutter. Looked at the things we're called to lay aside and, and the one we're called to look at, which is Jesus. Finally, I want to share with you the secret to finishing the race. It's great to have some running tips, but eventually you get tired in a race and you feel like giving up. Anyone ever been there? I have. I know what it feels like. What do you do when you feel like giving up, when when metaphorically your legs are tired and your lungs are burning and the distance, there's still a distance to run and you just want to give up? Well, there's a small Three-letter word that's our our secret to finishing the race. It's the word joy. How did Jesus complete his race? How did he endure the cross and despise its shame? We read, for the joy that was set before him. It was joy. What was the joy, though? For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy before Jesus was the finish line. He endured the cross by focusing on the joy that would be his when he finished the race. And we read that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's the end of his race. When you finish a race, what do you get to do? You get to sit down. Again, my my running knowledge is limited here, um, so just, just throwing this out there. But I don't think I've ever heard of someone at the finish line say, that was a bad idea. Why did I do that? It's always the people in the middle of the race, right? Like, why am I doing this? This was a bad idea. Jesus' joy was completing the race of faith, accomplishing our salvation, being raised from the dead, sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God and receiving all of the glory that was due to him. The joy of the finish line is what motivates us when the race of faith is hard. Friends, the race of faith, this side of life, it is hard. There's no sugarcoating it. It may feel at times like agony, agona, but the finish line will be so sweet. As I I wrap up this morning, I just want to encourage some of you Um, depending on where you are in your race of faith. Just a couple of encouragements. I know there are some people here who are are just getting started in this race of faith. I'm so thankful we have uh, people here who who are are at that point. And I know in my own faith journey, that was a a very sweet time. Jesus was was very gracious to me as a college student when I I came to know him. and uh, My life was a hot mess. And I had all kinds of sin and all kinds of weight going on. Sometimes, still a hot mess. Um, But he gave me a a wonderful sense of his presence and gave me a passion to serve 
um, in a local church one day, and uh, it was a very sweet time. If you're there today, I'm, I'm so glad for you, but days are coming when the race of faith will be hard, when the hills will loom large. Just don't be surprised when it comes, because it's coming. Look to Jesus and keep running the race of faith. Some of you are, are, are with me. We're, um, we're assuming we're in the middle of the race. We've been following Jesus for a while. Um, I think this might be the hardest one uh, because it's where I am. So just, I think it's probably the hardest. Although people further along may say it wasn't that hard. I don't know. But when you're in the middle of the race, you don't have the excitement of the start and you're still pretty far from the finish. Friends, if you're with me in that stage, cling to Jesus. We will not make it to the end without him. Prioritize him in your life. I know it's busy. It's busy for me, and I struggle to do it. Jesus is our only hope for finishing the race. Look to Jesus and keep running the race of faith. Finally, we have some older saints here. Um, I don't know how to be circum uh, more mature saints here who are closer to the end of their race. Can I just encourage you to finish your race? Don't give up. Don't become passive about your faith when some of the pressures of life have eased up. You can retire from a career or a job but you don't retire from the race of faith while you still have breath. Those of us who, who aren't as far along, but we're feeling tired, we need your example. One that we can see in the flesh, just like the readers, they needed to look back at the, the heroes of the faith and they need to look to Jesus. We, we are looking to you. Your decisions and your choices, they encourage and they challenge us. We need you as individuals and we need you as a church. Keep running. You are not done. Finish your race. Look to Jesus and keep running the race of faith. A while back, we uh, took our girls to Rocky Mountain National Park. And if you've ever um, road tripped with small children, you know every bathroom stop is precious. Every opportunity. So um, when we arrived there, we stopped at the visitor center and went in. It's, it's um, outside of the park. And we, uh, we got back to our car, and someone had parked next to us, and we could tell he was kind of looking out over the park. Um, and we were loading up, and he said, Hey, I, I, I hear it's 20 bucks to get in. We said, yeah, yeah. He looked out over the mountains and this line of cars that are getting ready to go into the park from around the country. And he said, not, I'm not making this up, he said, is it worth it? We were kind of stunned for a second and we just said, yeah. It, yes, it is worth it. Millions of people have come here before you and come back. We've come here and we're back. It's worth it. And when we think about the difficulties of the race of faith, I think we ask the same question, is it worth it? And the answer is yes. The saints who came before, those we know who have gone before us in the race of faith, they say yes. The finish line was worth every difficulty Jesus, who endured the cross, says, yes, it's worth it. Wherever you are today in your own race, friends, don't grow weary and lose heart. Lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This week, keep running the race of faith. In 2020, run the race of faith. Jesus is with you. He will give you the grace to keep running. Look to him. Don't grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray. Jesus, these things are impossible unless you help us. We can't drop weights or sin in our lives unless we have something that is better, someone who is better, someone who loves us and gives us grace, but also helps us to change and to keep going. Pray that you would speak to each one of us now. I pray that as we come to celebrate communion, we would be reminded and strengthened and encouraged. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.